Um, my name is Veronica, um, as some of you may know. Um, I'm originally from Poland and I've been in UAP for five years. Um, I'm currently chairing um, the Safe Queer team, which we're going to get back to later because that's relevant. Um, but it's basically a newly created um, UAP council that's tasked with everything anti-harassment, anti-bullying, well-being related um, in the network. Um, so yeah, the reason for this module and why I thought it's important to have it um, is that as amazing as organization is, there were and still are instances of sexual harassment happening, um, other forms of harassment as well. Um, and last year in a survey done um, by the GB, at least um, 200 people came forward and that's probably a sliver of um, you know, tall instances because it's not easy to report things like this. Um, and what I sort of personally observed over the years was that Things when they happened um, in UAP are usually swept under the rug. No one really wants or knows how to deal with them and um, nothing really happens in the end. Um, and this will be concerning in any context, but this is particularly concerning in the context of UAP because we pride ourselves on being an organization which is providing young people with a safe environment in which they can open up, be comfortable, be themselves and so on. Um, and sort of even a small incident of harassment, not to mention serious cases of assault can have a massive impact on how someone experiences organization. Um, so sort of the goal for this module would be for you to know how to personally contribute to building a better sort of genuinely caring positive environment at sessions, um, but also hopefully you can take it outside of UAP as well and um, apply it in other areas of life. So there's a few parts of um, this module. First we'll talk about consent generally. So what is it, what is it not? how to express it, how to ask for it, um, what sort of small forms harassment can take at sessions um, that probably you have also witnessed in the past, um, then how you can speak up about things when they make you uncomfortable, and finally, what to do if you witness a situation that you think potentially uh, might be, you know, gray area concerning. Um, so let's start with the basics, if I can make this work, yes. Can everyone see the screen? Okay, I'll take the nodding as a yes. Um, so does anyone wanna have a go and tell us what do you think consent means? So how in like a romantic sexual context um, can we tell if someone consents to something? Anyone? Okay, I can, um, <laughs> I, I would say that consent is in general um, an agreement, so something that um, both parties agree on, and that would be in any field, but also, of course, in romantic um, sense as well, so that both uh, people are agreeing on something. Okay. Um... So in a context of sort of dating or, you know, sexual, how would a person express consent? When would you know that someone consents? There could be different ways of expressing consent. I would say you could do that. Um, verbally but sometimes perhaps some body language but there should be an understanding that both people are agreeing on the same thing so unless there is a vivid uh yes then it is not a consent exactly um so this basically brings us to key things that um are sort of main takeaways um, from you know what is consent. So as Mariam already said, everything that's not an enthusiastic, clearly expressed yes is a no. So for example, silence or lack of protest aren't enough, aren't a valid um, form of consenting. Um, same with, um, for example, implied um, consent. So you can't really assume that someone consents to something on the basis of anything. And I'm going to list sort of what that could be in a sec. Um, but 
unless you have a very clearly expressed yes, you have to take it as a no. Um, a consent to one thing does not mean to, a consent to another. So this, first of all, means that a consent to a kiss doesn't, for example, mean a consent to having sex, um, but also that um, a consent to a kiss today doesn't necessarily mean a consent to a kiss tomorrow. Um, and that brings us to point three. Consent has to be ongoing. So it can be withdrawn at any time. And you don't have to justify yourself or a person who's with you doesn't have to justify themselves uh, themselves if at any point um, they sort of don't feel like doing a certain thing anymore. Um, and that also means that sort of past romantic or sexual involvement also doesn't justify anything. So if you, for example, witness some potentially shady situation happening, um, but two people you know have a history of um, sort of being involved consensually, it doesn't change anything. If you find it concerning, you should react in the same way that you would um, otherwise. And for it, a person has to always be in a state when they can be conscious um, enough to give consent. And that brings us to, first of all, talking about alcohol, um, which is a prominent sort of factor in many incidents that I've either witnessed or heard of in UAP. Um, so even if a person is conscious but highly intoxicated, it can be sort of questioned to what extent they are able and in a position to, to sort of give consent. Um, and same, that's actually something that's been brought to my attention very recently. We deal with extreme, extreme tiredness at certain moments in UAP. And it can be that a person is sort of out of place and unable to give consent simply because they're too tired or too stressed. Um, and there's sort of many factors that you can look out for, um, either when it comes to yourself, um, people that you're sort of being involved with, or if you if you see um, if if you witness a situation that that involves this, and something important I have to mention here, um, so all of those apply if we talk to people who are sort of at the same level. Um, we have golden rules, uh, the golden rule and the silver rule for a reason, um, and this is because sort of a relationship of power, a relationship of trust, changes um, sort of the environment in which you give consent. And this is also the case in actual law, not only in UAP, um, that if a person is a superior, um, they should not get involved in any circumstances um, with a person that sort of depends on them because the person isn't really in a position to give a valid consent if, for example, their evaluation depends on it. Um, and recently, uh, there actually been a policy in UAP that addresses this, um, but I'm going to go back to that. All right, um, so now the main thing that people fear with communicating consent is usually that it will kill the mood, quote unquote, um, because we've been taught that dating and quote unquote hooking up has to have this uh, mysterious aura of a game where you're not really sure and you play hard to get. Um, and this is a problem because you should be sure. If you're not sure, then you're doing something wrong. Um, and what you're doing could be non-consensual. So asking for consent doesn't necessarily have to mean, um, you know, saying plainly, do you want to kiss? Although you could, and I promise it will not kill the mood. It will actually make your relationship with someone more open, more honest. But if you really don't want to do this, um, there's plenty of ways to sort of ask for consent and receive, con like see if, if, you, if you have the person's consent without um, doing so. So you can, for example, be very attentive. You should be very attentive to how other person is sort of receiving, whether they're reciprocating, um, how they react to things that you do, and don't escalate things unless you're really sure that the person's on the same page. Um, sort of check in with them if they enjoy something to the same extent that you do, um, because clear communication is always, in all circumstances, a better option than assuming something and risking that you might actually be harming someone uh, or making them uncomfortable. Um, and if someone doesn't consent, don't take it personally. Um, rejections are part of life and they will happen. Um, and they don't say anything about you as a person. Um, just that one person did not feel like doing certain thing at a certain time. And there's also something that if you, for example, witness a situation in which a person is not taking rejection from someone really well, and that brings them to sort of doing things that could pass as harassment. Um, you know, talk to this person, make them feel, you know, loved by their friends and so on, 
um, make sure that this doesn't cause them to, to do any harm to anyone. Um, all right, so what makes harassment? Now, consent is what can be the difference between having fun and harassment or even assault. And we tend to think sort of about harassment and assault as you know, clear things like catcalling, groping, rape. But truth is, harassment can be anything if one side of the ones involved doesn't consent to it or feels uncomfortable because of it um, or otherwise harmed. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to come from bad intentions. And that's something that I've seen in UAP a lot. Things aren't really done in bad faith. It's not about the action itself. It's about how it impacts, um, you know, how it makes someone else feel. And that's what people often overlook um, and think that they're not doing anything wrong. So for example, if a person A flirts very intensely with person B and person B enjoys it and, you know, is interested in person A as well, it's flirting and it's great and beautiful. But if this person A would, you know, flirt with a different person C in exactly the same way, but person C is visibly not interested and uncomfortable in the situation, um, and person A is being persistent and doesn't stop and keeps trying, then it's a completely different situation and it's no longer okay, it's harassment. So the situation, the, situ yeah, the situation is completely different, even if the action performed is, um, is the same. And another thing is that, um, you know, those things don't have to be limited to interaction between two people. And there's a host of other things that on their surface might be innocent that we do in UAP or we observe in UAP, but they can have negative consequences on someone's ex experience um, in UAP. So for example, um, games that make someone comfortable, and this is not only in a context of, um, of team building in a comedy, um, but what's even more concerning is um, what I've witnessed, for example, sort of games with sexual subtext that are played by the whole official team in the evening, um, despite there being people who clearly feel uncomfortable with the situation, um, but there's simply a lack of an alternative um, because everyone else does it. So that's something, if, if you see this happening at sessions, this is actually a very easy one to remedy. Try to make sure that there's an alternative activity going on, um, that whoever feels uncomfortable with this one um, can always sort of spend their evening in a different way. Um, another very common thing is um, sort of aggressive matchmaking. And this comes from a purely well-intentioned place. Um, it's sort of, for example, pushing to people that you think might really like each other to get together or desperately finding a match for someone at a session. Um, but this is very often, you know, um, making two people either feel awkward or even harassed. And I've seen instances where this has been really, I mean, not traumatizing, but a really negative experience for someone where they've been pushed um, to sort of engage in, you know, with someone or in activities that they didn't really feel like um, because their friends sort of were coming at it from a, from a good, good place, but with, with bad um, actions. Um, another thing is catchiness. Um, that can be either just culturally foreign to some people, um, or, you know, someone might simply not enjoy being touched. And this is something we take in granted for, UA, uh, for granted in UAP. Um, but there's people who will find this uncomfortable. And it's important to be attentive um, to when that happens and not cross sort of their lines. Um, and other ones include persistent sexual jokes, um, gossip about other people's sexual romantic activity. This is prevalent and this can be sometimes innocent. But when it reaches a level of, for example, the infamous UAP scoreboard that's um, recently has been around again, um, this is a form of harassment and this is sharing people's very private information um, sort of in a non-consensual way. Um, all of those things have um, very negative consequences for how someone feels in an organization, even though we might not perceive it as such. Um, and obviously another thing is that for the sake of brevity, I'm not going to talk about, but um, similarly small sort of non-sexual um, harassment, bullying episodes. And hopefully thing I'm gonna talk, things I'm going to talk about will also help you to react to whatever you see. It doesn't necessarily have to be sexual harassment. How to communicate it. Um, when someone does something that makes you feel uncomfortable and you don't really want to make a fuss and you don't want to confront them, um, but you also just don't feel good in the situation. Um, so the first rule will be use the shortest path whenever possible. Um, so rather than, you know, 
run off to your friends and tell them, listen, this person is a creep. This is what they're doing. It really bothers me. And sort of spreading um, the news. If it's possible, if it's not grave enough or traumatizing enough that you can't do it, talk to the person directly. Because we're in a very comfortable position, UAP, that um, we have exceptions, but most people are actually good people and they don't do things purposefully in an evil way, but rather they're simply not aware of their actions and how they impact other people. And what it usually takes is simply to point out clearly and loudly to them um, that what they're doing you know, is negative for other people. Um, so whenever it's possible, just talk to the person directly rather than sort of spreading um, information around and sharing um, with you know other people at the session for example um because in that case they might react in a different way um and feel sort of more pressured um and this would not end up um, good for anyone um and two rather than attacking the person for what they're doing just take a step back and talk about how it makes you feel because this is something easier for people to accept than being personally sort of confronted about you know who they are as a person and they might get defensive if, if you do that. So, you know, say the fact that your hand is on my knee makes me uncomfortable, please stop, rather than, you know, you're a creep, what are you doing, get out of here. Um, this is basically communicating the same thing, but in a way that the other person will understand and take in and not find, you know, offensive and dismissible. Um, so the second part is sort of how you can look out for others at the session. It can be friends, it can be strangers, it can be anyone. Um, the simplest tip out there is basically just use your eyes and common sense to spot potentially problematic situations and know how to react. And with this, you can actually make a massive difference into someone's life. Um, it can have an impact on not only this person's experience of UIP, but you know, every time you show that you care, every time you do something, when you're sort of not sure if you should do something, you're actually building a better culture in the organization because this way other people will see that you know this is the sort of thing that you react to and act upon um and you know you don't know where they're going to take this and you don't know if they might not help someone in the future even if the case that you saw yourself was innocent in the end so what are some warning sound signs for an outside observer that someone um that something might be wrong um sort of look at not how grave a situation is per se, but rather pay attention to how the person that you think might be a victim in the situation um, feels. And this is usually a good indicator of whether someone's uncomfortable with what's happening, even though the action itself, as we talked about earlier, um, might not be um, you know, um, concerning as it is. If you see something potentially shady happening, um, you know, sometimes the situation will be clearly wrong and requires immediate action, um, but sometimes you won't really be sure. And this is sort of the hardest um, line to cross. Um, and in this rule, in this case, the rule is over always um, just to check in um, because you can't really go wrong on checking in. It never hurts to be a friend to someone even if you don't know them. Um, so if you see something concerning, um, you know, you've noticed someone might be uncomfortable, um, just approach them, ask them how they're doing. Um, if it's you know, a situation that's been persistent and you sort of see that person um, alone at some point in the session, you know, approach them and say, you know, I've been noticing this thing, are you okay? Um, is there anything I can do? Are you, you know, comfortable? How are you feeling about this? Um, or if it's a situation that's happening sort of before your eyes, um, just check in with them as it's happening to make sure that, you know, the situation is cons consensual. Um, and this also gives them a way out of the situation if it's not. Um, so it's not a, you know, it's a very low cost solution for you to just come up to someone and ask how they're doing, but it can make a massive difference if a person can, you know, get out of the situation or not. So you probably experience this at some point in your life, um, even, you know, on a street or outside of a bar, um, or, you know, when other kids were bullied at school, whatever, um, you see something shady happening and you hesitate and you could check if everything is okay, but also, 
you know, it's none of my business. It's probably nothing. I don't want to make a fuss. It's going to be awkward if I ask. Um, you know, someone else will probably do something anyway. Um, and that's why most people actually, you know, walk past harassment. Um, when we see something concerning, we have a thought that we maybe should step in and just ask and check, um, but we end up not doing anything. And until a couple of years ago, I was actually guilty of this. And then last year it happened to me that I did step in to just ask random people if, if you know, if everything was okay. And it ended up in a guy um, who was, um, you know, guilty of domestic abuse for years, who was actually taken to a police station. Um, and this sort of only proved to me that for the 10 situations where you step in and it's nothing and you might feel slightly awkward, there's always this one where, you know, you see that it actually made a difference for someone. Um, so it's always, always better to check in rather than not. And the UAP context, the main sort of obstacle to doing something um, might actually be that you know the people involved and you don't want to confront them, you don't want to accuse them, you know, this could cause tensions in the team and so on. Um, it's a bit awkward. Um, but you can see in a sec how you can intervene without making an argument. So how to do it in a smart way, where you don't really confront the person, but you can still sort of disrupt a concerning situation from happening. So another thing is that because of how hooking up became part of um, the culture in UAP, when we see two people um, even drunk, we assume it's consensual. So we don't want to be uncool. We don't want to, you know, kill the mood when two people are having a thing. And again, you don't have to. You will see, I mean, unless you see something clearly outrageous, of course, in which case you have to react immediately. Um, you don't have to separate anyone and start an investigation other than that. Um, just check if everything is all right. And this you can do in, in very simple, sort of straightforward ways. Um, and I can assure you, if two people do want to, um, you know, hook up at a session, I promise you that you disrupting them for two minutes, um, if it's for nothing, um, will not prevent this from happening. So how do we intervene in a graceful, smart way? Um, there's three types of interventions that you can use, and they're called three Ds, as it's easy to remember. Um, the first one is direct. So you, for example, see, let's say um, it's a guy um, sort of taking aside a very intoxicated um, girl on a session. You see that it's not going to end well. You approach them and you say, listen, dude, this is not OK. You have to stop this. Um, you take the girl with you. You make sure that she's safe and that she ends up sort of in your, in your own bed. Um, Another thing that you can do is to delegate, um, which is basically about getting other people involved. Um, and this can be, for example, you know, at a session, if you see something really concerning happening and if you don't really know how to handle this, um, you can go and grab the welfare officer, and now it's called a safe person, who will probably know better how to handle it. Or you can um, you know, refer to the team leader of a given team, or a president, or just someone that you think would be a lot better at handling this than you are. Although after this training, you should be the friend that other people get to do it. Um, or it can be, for example, a friend of one of the sides. So it can be a friend of the person who is potentially being um, assaulted or harassed um, to sort of say, listen, your friend is very intoxicated there. I think you need to react and make sure that she's safe. Or you can talk to a friend of the quote unquote perpetrator um, to basically say to them, listen, this is not okay what your friend is doing, can you please make sure that he stops? Um, but when you do delegate, make sure that you don't get out of the picture. Um, even if you trust people to take care of something, it's always better to sort of stay attentive and, and see um, how the situation ends. Because um, especially if, it, it's, if it's a matter of, um, you know, people um, as friends, it's not necessarily the case that they will um, take enough steps to prevent the situation from happening, uh, sort of stay on alert. Um, and the third strategy, which is I think my favorite, um, it's about being sneaky about it. Um, so if it's people you know, for example, um, you can approach them and, you know, do something to distract your attention from the situation. And this will, of course, depend on whether your goal is to, if it's a situation where you're not sure and you just want to disrupt the situation and check in, it's going to be different than when you um, know that something's wrong, you know, the guy is dragging the girl out and you just want to stop the situation and make sure that she's safe. 
Um, but the basic concept is that you distract people with something ridiculous um, to sort of take them out of the situation. So you could, um, if it's people you know, you could, for example, say um, to the perpetrator, oh, listen, this person has been looking for you for ages. Um, they say it's very urgent. You need to go there right now and check it out. Um, you know, they go away. And, and in this case, you can um, take care, focus on taking care of the victim when the person comes back. The situation is already dissolving over. Um, another thing, um, if, for example, you know, it's strangers, um, there's many things you can do. You can say, you know, I'm sorry, where's the bathroom? Um, could you show me a way to this place? Um, one story I heard about was, um, was at a party with friends and a guy was trying to assault a woman um, and another person basically shouted, oh, your car is getting towed, even though that was a complete lie. And the guy just stormed out to take care of the car. Um, and by the time he came back, the situation was non-existent. Um, so this, you know, if you're just checking in, a short distraction, like asking for time or whatever, gives you an opportunity to see if the person is okay and see, you know, if they're intoxicated, if they're consented to this, consenting to this, um, and sort of give them an out as well. So you can ask them, oh, like, we haven't talked in so long. Do you want to like, go over there and, and talk? Um, or, or if you want to disrupt the situation, as I said, there's also ways to sort of take this person out of the picture and make sure that nothing happens. Um, of course, which way you go for of the free and whether you use it to just check in or, you know, stop the situation from happening will depend on what type of situation you're witnessing. Um, but um, if uh, you'd like to sort of participate more now, um, what do you think, in what kind of situation would you use each of those approaches? Um, so you can give an example either for one or for two of them or for three, um, it's up to them. So describe a potential situation in which you think it would be fair to react in one of those three ways. Please. I, I get so Nathan here. I guess what one example could be um, during um, during our classic kind of evening parties and stuff like that amongst officials you can see that there's one official who just constantly keeps hitting on the other person and the other person just doesn't want to make it awkward. So they just like very neutral about it, but you can kind of see something there. And I guess in this case, it could be um, a little bit of the mix between like one and three of distracting. So it could be the person who keeps doing the, who keeps hitting on the other person. Um, the person who's doing the hitting is kind of like pulling them away and, um i don't know finding another game to play with them or wanting to have a chat with them or say oh let's let's catch up something like this and then through the conversation also to kind of highlight what you kind of saw and that for for you that that wasn't necessarily okay yeah perfect um so i think what's what's really cool about combining approaches is that the reason you would for example use the distraction strategy is to not cause a scene and not um, sort of engage in, in drunken discussions with, with anyone um, because this is not a productive way to talk about this. Um, but if you do have an opportunity, then being direct has the advantage of, you know, having an educational value. So you sort of not only ensure that this didn't happen now, but you can potentially talk to the person about sort of their general behavior and maybe that will cause them to not do it again. So the hope is sort of that, you know, there's a, an educational value in, in all of this. Um, anyone else would like to have a go? All right. Um, so a few commandments that I got out of being a good bystander to other people, um, and sort of practical things that you can do to create a better culture around this uh, European general would be to first pay attention to what's going on around you. And that sounds very obvious. That sounds, you know, like a no-brainer. Um, but it's actually not. Because when you're at a session, um, you, you know, a lot is going on. You're in your own head. You have on a lot of responsibilities. You're dealing with a lot of things. You're catching up with friends, looking at your phone, whatnot. Um, so just make it a habit that you're more attentive to what's going on around you. Um, and how people around you, strangers included, um, you know, are feeling, or how do, 
to you it seems that they're feeling. Um, and this is not only about sexual harassment. Um, similarly, if you spot people who, for example, look very down for whatever reason, um, or tired or intoxicated, it has an extreme value because it gives you the possibility to be that person who you know can approach them and ask what's wrong or suggest they should probably go to bed. And in this way, you sort of address many other problems potentially um, that don't necessarily have to be uh, you know, related to sexual harassment. So Jenny, like put yourself in a mindset of always being attentive and trying to care more about what other people, not necessarily just your group of friends, but everyone around you at a session, um, how they might be feeling um, and try to think of what you can do if you see that um, something, something's wrong. Um, check in, check in, and once again, check in to identify if the situation is problematic. It literally doesn't cost you anything, no time at all, to just approach someone and see if everything is okay. Um, and it can allow you to identify problematic situations. And this is where, you know, many people already um, sort of stop being involved, as I already said, because they hesitate if they could, should, or um, can check in, and then they don't. Um, so if you do go to step two, you're already far ahead from what most people would do. And three, assume personal responsibility. So don't count on someone else um, for not only spotting it, but also to sort of taking it further and dealing with it. Um, if you see something, be that person. Um, and this goes just beyond the context of intervening. This goes also to generally the culture that you see in UAP. So if you, for example, um, know that your NC is organizing a session or a friend of yours is organizing a session or is in a leadership or you're in a leadership position, um, see to it that, for example, um, there is a safe person at the session, that there is an alternative evening plan that doesn't involve games that might make people uncomfortable. But if something happens, it's not swept under the rug, but it's actually passed on and dealt with. Um, those are very small things. Um, but if everyone took care of them taking place and then the policy actually being enforced, um, we would see a lot less of what we're seeing right now. Um, so hopefully when you leave this module, you're going to be able to sort of think of all the sessions that you're participating in in the future um, and making sure that all of them have the policy that I'm going to talk about enforced. And last one, know how to help. And it's okay if sometimes you don't. Um, sometimes things are very complicated. If something's sort of too complicated or serious enough that it has to be acted on and dealt with, um, get in touch with someone who does know and who's in the capacity to do so, like the safe person at the event or the international safe person. Don't try to solve it on your own if um, it's a situation that requires sort of more action beyond just stopping it and beyond just helping helping the victim. So how to respond if you do find out or witness um, that harassment or assault took place. Um, so well-being of the victim comes first and that should be, self uh, that should be obvious. Um, before you do anything, your priority should be to make sure that the person who has been harassed um, is well taken care of, um, that they feel comfortable, that they feel safe, um, but for example, if they no longer want to participate in an event, um, you sort of make it possible for them not to participate, take them aside, you know, give them water, sit them down, don't necessarily, you know, try to get the whole story out of them at first, just let them be comfortable and let them be safe. Um, and once they want to talk, that's when they're going to talk to you and don't try to rush it. Um, it's also very important how you talk to people. So make it very clear to them that they're not at fault for anything that happened and make them very clear to them that um, you know the story that, you, that they share is safe with you but at the same time don't promise that you won't tell anyone because that should not be true explain who um, you're going to share this with and why so for example if a situation happened that will be you know referred to the, sh um, the, the safe person and has to be dealt with you can't promise the person that you're not going to share it with anyone because you have a responsibility to share it um, and you don't want to let them down on this. So explain why exactly and with whom and make sure that you stop the information from spreading at the session itself. Whenever 
something like this happens, there's usually a lot of gossip. Um, it, you should feel personally responsible for making sure to cut them as much as possible in whatever way you can, um, instead of you know keeping everything down and assuring to the extent possible that the privacy of, of the two people is, um, is not compromised. Um, don't jump into blaming um, the person who committed the harassment um, because as much as you might be sure about what happened, there's always two sides to a story. Um, and as I also listed here, it's very important that you do get both sides of the story um, because it's only fair that the other person has an opportunity to at least share what things were like from their perspective. Um, so if it's something that you need to report, report it to the safe person present at the event. Um, if there's none or for some reason you or the victim doesn't want to report to that particular person um, because you, they don't feel comfortable talking to that person or they are friends of the perpetrator or whatnot, um, you can always report to the international safe person, um, which I'm going to um, go back to later um, about who that is and how that works. Don't force the victim to face the accused um, person unless they uh, you know, express a willingness and, and consent to being confronted with them and, and talking sort of in one room. Um, don't make them do it because that can um, be sort of re-traumatizing and you can easily get two sides of the story without putting people in the same room. Um, another thing that's also part of the policy, consequences should always and will always be proportional um, to the action. Um, so if um, you happen maybe in the future to be a safe person in a session, um, keep, this, um, keep this in mind, sort of potential actions are also um, described in the policy. And another important thing that I wanna just super briefly mention here is that as an official, you have a very special responsibility um, for delegates. And this is for various reasons. First of all, because especially as a chair, you're the person of trust. Um, and second of all, there's also an age difference and an experience difference. Um, and you sort of come at a session from completely different, different ways and you have a different capacity to deal with things. So you're not only responsible for looking out for yourself and for people around you, but just look out for what's happening among the delegates as well, as you know, weird as it may sound, because they're a lot less likely to be, you know, to remember who they should report something to. Um, or you know know something that something's serious enough, or they might simply feel ashamed or you know trivialize it, don't want to talk about it. Um, so you know whenever you see either your delegate or someone else's delegate um, um, clearly uncomfortable in a situation or just down for whatever reason, um, you know if it's if it's your delegate, uh, you should be their person of trust because you also the person who if they tell anyone they will tell you. Um, if it's someone else's, just, just let you know the, the other chair, for example. Um, so keep in mind that, you know, delegates, as cliche as it is, are a lot more vulnerable than you are and do not have the resources and sort of connections to know who to go to. So you have to be the person to reach out to them. Now, what does the policy say? Um, so last year, the policy on safeguarding safety and dignity in UAP was finally passed. And this is just a sort of brief recap for you to know what the main things in it are, so you can refer to them when, when you need to. Um, so first of all, uh, what's cool about it, it applies to all UIP related events and activities, not only ASs, but it can be even you know, a members weekend of an NC, um, it can be a board retreat, it can be anything that's you know, related to your um, volunteering work for UIP. It also defines harassment, bullying, et cetera, so if you're not sure, if something sort of qualifies, this is where you could go um, to see. Um, the policy theoretically should be communicated to all participants at all events before the beginning of it. Um, and this is another thing, take personal responsibility if you're at an event to make sure that this happens. Usually the best thing is to communicate to officials um, because also we don't want to freak delegates out, plus they probably won't really remember things are said in a big room because a lot of people give speeches and they don't really know what's going on. Um, but, you know, make sure that, uh, for example, um, chair people or organizers communicate this further to delegates um, so that they know that there is a safe person at an event who, if anything, you know, bothers you um, or you feel uncomfortable with anything, this is where you go. Um, 
and this brings us to safe persons. Um, so by the policy, um, what used to be called the welfare officer is now called um, safe persons. And the way it works is that every event should have an event safe person, um, which is a person, you know, you, your point of contact for all things safety and well-being related. Um, you know, also bullying, mental health problems, anything. Um, in Yerevan, this will be monicidal from the international office, um, but theoretically every session, you know, should have a designated person who is sort of trustworthy um, um, and approachable with, with an impeccable record um, that, you know, participants would be willing to talk to. Um, at smaller sessions, it usually makes sense that it's a person who speaks the local language as well. Um, and then there's a national safe person who should be someone, for example, an older alumni who's not tied to the board of the NC in any way, um, but that, for example, if things happen outside of sessions, but within the UIP context, people in the NC could go to. And the last person is the international safe person, which is um, a member of the GB responsible for, uh, for the policy, um, which right now is Maria Manolescu. And um, consequences for the perpetrator, as I mentioned, um, are proportional to um, so the gravity of the situation. And all decisions made are binding on national and international bodies. So for example, what's been lacking for a very long time now is in place, that if someone committed, um, for example, sexual assault, they might be um, in excluded from participating in sessions ever again. And this will be um, you know, a binding on all NCs and all international sessions and so on. So they actually won't be able to participate. And uh, in case the silver rule is broken, um, the team member, this is, the new, this is not part of this policy, but it has been passed literally a few days ago. Um, the team member can request um, an evaluation by the involved leader that they had a thing with to be removed if they feel like that, um, you know, the breaking of the silver rule might have influenced um, the content of this. Um, of this evaluation sort of to their, um, to their harm. Um, now about the safe core team, um, which is important for you because um, it relates to, in many ways to sort of the course of action that you might take if you, um, if you see a breach of the policy or if you see a concerning situation. Um, so one of the things that we do, but I would argue the most important one, is we handle harassment complaints according to the policy. Um, so what happens is that as of a few days ago, we have established um, an email address, safe at uip.org, um, where people can either submit official complaints about someone's behavior, or um, they can simply share their stories and ask what would the possible course of action be, um, you know. Um, so um, we, uh, only two people um, have access to this email, it's highly confidential. It's myself and Maria Manolescu from the GB. Um, and if um, the complaint is sort of asked to be um, acted upon, we will uh, make it anonymous before passing it on to the Safe Core team, um, which is a team of um, six very much highly selected people um, who will look at it anonymously and decide what is the appropriate sort of proportional course of action to this particular um, behavior. Um, another thing we do is to make sure that the existing measures are enforced uh, and publicize it, cooperate with NCs to ensure that they do the same, um, develop trainings for the safe people. Um, this is something that I'm really looking forward to um, this year. Um, advise the safe persons at sessions when needed. So for example, there will be a possibility that we're developing now for safe persons at events if they are not sure about what to do about something. Um, they could, for example, call us or have some sort of like immediate um, way of communicating with us to ask for um, advice on certain things. Um, and we can also propose new measures in the area of safety and well-being generally. Um, so if you, for example, have ideas after, um, after this module on what you would like to see done, um, get in touch. Um, and sort of the last few things that I, that I wanted to say that I think are um, important is that what makes um, sort of anti-harassment policy, um, anti-harassment sort of activities difficult in UIP? Um, because we're all friends, there's a huge culture of sort of romantic and, and sexual involvement. 
and many things are just left unnoticed or trivialized um, because especially if we're from a country that you know where it's not really talked about this can be seen even stronger but it's very easy to justify things to for example say oh you know he or she isn't like that he or she was just drunk he or she you know was just tired he or she didn't really mean anything um, and no <laughs> if you're uncomfortable with something as we already said the best way is always to communicate this very clearly to someone because this not only helps you in your situation but this sends a clear signal to someone who might not have been aware of their action that this is wrong and that they should not do it again so voice your discomfort um, we keep talking about how communication is key and this is you know no different here and it's a good um, way to to practice it another thing um, this sadly tends to be a gendered issue um, and most of the complaints we receive is sort of a guy harassing girl being a guy doesn't mean that you can't be harassed um, it doesn't mean those cases would only concern women so if you're a guy and you feel uncomfortable with something someone else does this is equally valid and you should seek to address it um, and you should also know um, sort of how to support your male friend if something like this happens um, so if you feel uncomfortable with someone's behavior or you have been you know harassed or assaulted remember that you did nothing wrong um, those things are very uncomfortable to report, um, especially, you know, in a session environment where this could be your friends, this could be your acquaintances. Um, and, you know, news also spread quite fast, um, but there's nothing to worry about. No situation is too small to report um, or too unharm unharmful to be reported. And there is now people in policy in place that are actually here um, and want to help you if anything happens. Um, I mean, EYP is a community, even if a very big one. And in the community, there's a sort of shared responsibility that we should look out for other people and we should make sure that they're safe. And something, you know, this is very intuitive to us when we give speeches and, you know, discuss topics, but it's a lot harder to live out in practice. And I hope after this module, you will have at least a basic idea of how to um, live that out in practice. So thanks a lot. Um, and if you have any questions or anything you would like to add or comment on or something you think I overlooked, um, you can either just mention it now or get in touch with me later. It's up to you. Thank you so much, uh, Veronica, for your module. Um, I just wanted to mention that we had a module by Veronica and uh, Giovanna in uh, Rotterdam on sexual consent and I was a witness of how much it has influenced the official team and the way we were interacting and I think I, I honestly cannot wait for to see how the whole network is going to be impacted by this so thank you so much for your module and thank you so much for making it on a such a professional level when it comes to the safety team and I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing this coming um, to life. And when it comes to the technical details, I already mentioned in the beginning of the module, uh, but also now that uh, this is going to be published on YouTube and you can definitely um, reach us out either by messaging um, us or by messaging the Facebook event. Um, also, we will be very glad to uh, get feedback from you either on the content or the technical part of the module and this has been the second um, module of the stream on the participants welfare so we have one more which will be uh, delivered by uh, Laura Teixeira on the first aid so feel free uh, to join as well and feel free to join all the rest of the modules. Uh, thanks everyone for participating and unless anyone has any questions that would be it so good night and once again thank you so much for coming and joining